Again, good morning, everyone. We're going to start the Budget and Finance Committee. Uh, thank you all for being here this morning. I don't think that we need to uh, ask if there's any conflict of interest because uh, that would be. Would you like a roll call, sir? Yeah, yes, please, just for the record. Mr. Rodriguez Pina? Here. Mr. Gonzalez? Here. Mr. Pago? Here. Mr. Walters? Ms. Weinberg? Chair Martinez? Here. Vice Chair Fano? Here. Also joining us are Mr. Cancio? Here. And Mr. Meyer? Present. Um, I guess next would be the uh, declaration of voting conflicts. Uh, in, in, does anybody have any voting conflicts that they need to disclose at this point in time? Okay. See none. Let the record reflect there's no voting conflicts. Public comments. Yep. Um, anybody from the public that wishes to address us at this point in time? Any valuable insights that we can benefit from? Seeing no one getting up, uh, public comments are closed. Now let's move to the approval of uh, minutes. Move them. Okay. All in favor? Signify saying aye. Anybody opposed? Okay. Approved unanimously. Mr. Treasurer? Yep. Um, before we get into the, uh, the remaining action items, um, can we, uh, we have a change on the order of the action items um, due to one of the procurements? Yep. So we're, what we're going to be doing is we're going to take um, out of order uh, item G and take it up to item C, and that is to give uh, Helen, uh, we have to approve a minor irregularity, and once that's done, the tabulations will be done, and then Helen will report back to, to us what the, the final numbers were. So I guess we need a motion to move uh, the agenda out of order. Yes. So uh, motion to move it out of order. Got a motion to, to move. Okay. First and a second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. All right. So, Helen, do you want to talk about the item uh, G? Support. No, we're going to... Are we going to do the Treasury report now? Um, the, if we're going to move it to B, uh, item B, we're on. Okay. Okay. All the right. next item is, uh, is Helen's item, item C. Uh, is that the order you would like, Mr. Treasurer? Yes. Go ahead and do the, the Treasurer's report because that's B, and then C would be the one that we're moving up. So just to be consistent. Thank you. Appreciate it. The treasurer's report that is in your budget and finance package is for the two month of fiscal year 16, which is July and August of 2015. Um, from the standpoint of revenue, we're doing really well on revenue. Total and fee revenue is 35.3 million compared to 33 that was budgeted. Um, the variance of 2.2, the majority of that variance is due to fees um, for late fees and collection um, for toll by plate customers. Um, I don't. Um, for, for uh, the month of August, we had a very good month in our collection rate. So, again, most of that is generated from the fees. Um, interest income is pretty much right on target. It was 361, a little bit less on the budget, about $300,000. Um, on the expense side, operation is right on budget. So, I think they're doing really well on managing their budget. Um, the only item that I'd like to, to um, bring out on the expense side is on the administration. Um, for the month to date, our legal services are over budget, but for year to date, um, they're within the budget. Um, overall, our operating expense is about $117,000 below the forecast. So, again, it's about a little bit 1% um, right on target. Our interest expense is pretty much exactly what the budget is. As you all recall, we had refunded uh, two of the swaps, so we virtually have very little exposure to variable rate debt. So all in all, for net revenues for the two months, we posted $14.2 million. Um, so very positive results for the two months of fiscal year 16. Marie, let me ask you a question. Do we expect these, this revenue trend to continue? Is this something that uh, you feel that we reached the level of stability based on your projections? On the, um, on the fees, I think the fees trend is not going to continue at the same rate. I do think that we would, um, we're probably going to exceed the budget and what was forecast. Okay. Okay. Any questions of the Treasurer's report? And board members, for, just for, for information purposes, legal-wise, we are, we started, we're in the middle of the third week of trial with ETCC, so um, that's part of the reasons for the the budget. OK. 
Okay. Any any questions or comments? Well, Quick Maria, question. I just want to clarify. We are, even with the expense, the, ex, ex, the larger uh, legal expenses, we are under budget that we projected still in the tune of about one hundred seventeen thousand for the year at this point. Correct for the two months. Yes. For the first two months. Mm-hmm. So we're on pace to have a to continue to maintain it, barring some kind of unforeseen calamity. We're in, we're in really solid shape of being. I hope so. Lean and mean as always. We're certainly lean. I don't know about mean, but. <laughs> Gonzalez, you had a question. I answered. Thank my you. Own question. Okay, Thank you. you answered his own question. That's great. Very efficient of you. Okay. Any other questions or comments regarding the treasurer's report? Uh, as you can see, you know this is a a very uh, favorable report. I think we're, it's important to note that we are getting these fees, and that uh, it's a trend that's going to continue, and we're in a very good financial shape. So, with that said, do we need to move the treasurer's report? Does that uh, require a motion or just to, to accept it? Uh, to accept it and move it to yep. the board. Yep. Yeah. Move to approve it first. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Motion adopted. All right. Okay. Now we go to Helen. Is that correct? Yes. Helen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accommodating the change in the agenda. We- um, the action item is for MDX procurement contract number RFP 1505 for investment advisory services. There's two actions that we're requesting from this committee. Um, approval to waive manual irregularities of the technical proposal submitted by Sawgrass Asset Management. And the second item is the endorsement of Technical Evaluation Committee's recommendation to select the number one ranked proposer. MDS received three proposals in response to the RFP uh, from Chandler, Chandler Asset Management, First Southwest Asset Management, and Sawgrass Asset Management. Um, the proposals submitted by Sawgrass Asset Management contain minor irregularities uh, related to properly demonstrated the required years of experience. The RFP required that, uh, that they demonstrate um, that they have the required year, years of experience by submitting references that added up to the number of um, required years. They did, they did submit references, but they did not add up to the number of years. But there was other information within the proposal and also in the public records of the um, um, SEC, the uh, U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, that shows that both the firm and the uh, uh, proposed program manager do, in fact, have the required years of experience. In fact, they exceed it. So staff is asking that we waive that as a manual irregularity and allow them to be considered for um, evaluation purposes. Okay. Um, the Technical Evaluation Committee did meet um, last Monday, September 21st, um, and it did review and evaluate all proposals. Um, the scores were not tabulated pending um, um, action by this committee of the manual irregularity. So depending on the uh, committee's action today, we will go ahead and tabulate the scores as well as open the proposed fees that will be uh, part of the uh, overall final scores of the um, proposers. Okay. Board members, just for the record, I was the oversight member on this, and uh, this irregularity, uh, we had three proposals, all very good proposals, and this is a, uh, an irregularity that I discussed with staff, and uh, it's something to, to be voted on, but make sure that you have any questions to please ask. But if not, then once we approve this, we will be uh, tabulating the scores and selecting the the firm that would be a financial advisor. Well, for, yes, for purposes of discussion only at this point, not to vote so that we can. Investment advisor. Uh, I'll, I'll move the item for and uh, move the item so it can be open for discussion. Second. Okay. Now is item open for discussion? I'll defer to the member of the committee first, and then I'll have some follow-up questions to see okay. what anything else says first. Any from the any members from the committee? Uh, yep. Mr. Walters. Helen, when the uh, technical committee reviews these proposals. Are the irregularities pointed out to them? And are they factored into their scoring, the fact that they didn't follow the directions? They were not factored into the score, but they did understand that there was an irregularity with this proposal. Okay, I'm, I'm just wondering how that impacts. If I'm scoring a, uh, a proposal and it's pointed out to me that, well, you know, they didn't quite do this right, that's probably going to impact my, my decision. Well, they're evaluating based on the criteria, which is about qualifications, approach, et cetera. It doesn't um, take into account the, the responsiveness of it. I don't have a problem with it. I'm just trying to understand how it works. So the, the individual members scored the three teams, but you didn't put the scores together. Correct. And you lock that up, and the prices haven't been opened yet. That's correct. correct. Okay. Yeah. And again, it's something that if staff didn't recommend it, and I've I've been one as a stickler for my irregularities because we I'm I'm always concerned about setting a precedent. But uh, in this case, I, I I feel comfortable and and obviously defer a lot to uh, professional staff to say this is not a material impact to the overall qualifications. So, but are you any more questions? Okay. 
Mr. First, Martins. I'd like to thank uh, you know, the treasurer for his input on what he felt uh, as oversight. Since we weren't there, you were basically our eyes and ears, and I appreciate your, uh, your not only your time, but the fact that you gave us your opinion on this. Helen, I'm a little confused the way you explained it, though. Okay. okay. So the issue here, and if I'm correct, was there was a requirement to show a specific amount of years of experience to qualify to even bid on the project, correct? Correct. And in their initial proposal, they did not satisfy that requirement of the years necessary to qualify. Is, the that, is that in, the, in, the, in, in what they initially presented to us? Um, is yes that correct? No. no. Oh, okay. Well, let's go with the yes part and then we'll ask the no. Thank you. Um, the requirement is exactly what you said. We, they needed to have X number of years in order to be um, qualified. Okay. The RFP also required that the way that they were supposed to demonstrate those number of years was by submitting references that added up to the required number of years. Okay. The references that were submitted did not add up to the number of years, but there, were, there was other information within the proposal that did address that they did have the years of experience. But, but Helen, actually, then my questions were both yes and yes. They didn't follow the rules. However, there was other information in the proposals that, in fact, did satisfy the requirements. If that's what you said and I misunderstood, then I apologize. Then, yes, you're correct both. Okay. Yes. All right. So then, was it a misunderstanding of the regulations and the rules, or was it an error in the way the IRP was presented, or was it just you know, they didn't do proper math. You know, what is there? Is there? A, is there? Is there something that you can see why they? Because you know, that seems like a really not not to be petty, but that's kind of a basic issue. You either have ten years of, of experience or you don't. This isn't one of those where you're you missed a certificate. You didn't, you didn't. You forgot to put in a certification thing. So, is there? Did, did they give an explanation? I'm just. I did not request an explanation. Okay. When you say that it did have the information required in the RFP, could you be more specific where they reached the level to satisfy our concerns? There was information that talked about their relationship with other um, government entities for X number of years, although we didn't have, for example, a reference from that particular entity that said they had been working for us by okay. know, through this so, number of years. And also, as I mentioned in the um, in the public records of um, the SEC, there was also information about their records um, of years of experience and stuff that they have done that we can also verify that they have been doing this type of work for the, num the required number of years. Okay, but so then there was reference, there was discussions about other agencies they worked for, mm -hmm. and there was an issue on a public record request that could verify what they said, correct? Correct. There's but public information. Did they present that to you, or did you have to go out and find that? I went on the SEC to find it. So in other words, you had to do more work for these people because they didn't follow what is basically a simple uh, effort of math. Yes. Is that? I'm, sorry, Mr. Pagel. I'm a little annoyed. Mr. Pagel. Is that routine <laughs> practice that we would do something like that? Research it more for the firm to see if they qualify or are not qualified? The RFP did allow us to go to readily available information to verify um, responsiveness, yes. Yeah, but that's, okay, my, my issue here is that you had to go an extra step, yes. and we constantly hear, and I'm, my, we're, we're constantly hearing about our, our, our RFPs, and we're too, we're too hard line, we're too this, we're too that, and we're showing here an effort to go an extra mile to give someone an effort where really you could have just said, listen, you know what, you didn't qualify, goodbye, and you didn't. Okay, and this was really basic. So I, I think there's a, there's a certain sense of, of, of clarity in what our staff does to make sure that we are as above board and transparent with our RFPs as possible and that we give those who are bidding as much of a benefit of the doubt and we will go that extra mile to see if they qualify when it's a technical type of irregularity. When it's a minor um, irregularity, when it's something that does not provide it's, a complete I'm sorry, advantage. technical minor, I apologize. I used the wrong word and I apologize to staff for that. A, a, a minor irregularity. Am I the only one that's just a little annoyed? <laughs> oh, I, and I ask, I ask the other members of the committee, I'm sorry. I, I, I normally, as most of you know, I normally rarely object to minor regularities. This one just kind of is eating at me because it's like, why did we have to do that? Because you didn't tell me it was somewhere else. We've had this situation in the past where it was somewhere else in the proposal. I don't know if you recall. We've had that issue mm -hmm. where yeah. the certification wasn't there, but it was somewhere else. That's a lot different 
than you having to go out and verify their, their issue. That, that's the part that's, that's, for me, separates one issue from the other. So but, uh, am, am I being overly tech, nitpicky today or not? If I may. Just asking. Sure, go ahead, Ellen. If I may, um, this type of situation has come up before, and we have addressed it in the same manner. Thank the you. The example that you just presented where they didn't submit the, the certification we had, and there and it was, was some, it was that's somewhere else, we had to go look for it. <laughs> Good point. So it's point same, well taken. It's the same Thank you. concept. You have a question? Well, that was my question. Yeah. Uh, number one, I assume that our RFP has within its body the right for us as a board to waive Absolutely. minor irregularities that don't affect the competitive spirit of the transaction. Both our policy and the solicitation documents address that, yes, sir. You were telling us that they had the information in the four corners of their RFP. Of the proposal, yes. Right? As, as, as additional hmm? precaution, you went to the SEC to see if they had the experience they say they have within their RFP since you didn't have a reference. Correct. Okay. W w were, was the requirement for references a, a mandatory yes. part yeah. of the RFP? That's why it's a manual regularity because it was a requirement. Right. Okay. And, and in your opinion, that doesn't affect the competitive balance between the firms? No, because yeah. we're not waiving the fact that they need to have the years of experience. They do have to have that qualification. What we're waiving is the informality in the way that they presented it in their proposal. Thank you. Okay. Any, other, any other questions from the board? Uh, you, know, you know, Helen, I want to congratulate you and your staff. Okay? okay. You guys go the extra mile. And I want to, and that's, the, my main question about this is that, is that, you know, we sometimes, I think, we catch a lot of flack, and it's because people have a perception that it's not issued in fact, and this is one of those examples of us actually going the extra mile to be as fair as, as we can be to all bidders. Um, and and there's going to come a point where, I don't know about how everyone else feels, I'm, I'm obviously going to, I'm going to defer to staff and to the oversight on this one, on my vote for this day, but... You know, let, let's be, let this let this be a warning that if you're going to, you know, th those kind of things, we're not required to do it. We do it because staff wants to be fair, and I find that we acceptable. Want to maintain the highest level. Of exactly, so that's what the I mean. Best interest of the agency. Exactly. But so thank you. So um, I think it's important. I think it's important to, to we have this discussion. I, I think that this is something that's going to be a recurring, and I would imagine, Helen, that this over your career, you've seen this quite a bit. And the question is, if we try to create some policies, I think we then put ourselves into a box. And I think the discussion is healthy. However, uh, it is uh, part of Helen's job is to discern and distinguish what she considers to be a minor irregularity versus a qualification, something that is a, 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 a material impact to the best possible submission. So I think that's the, the subjectivity that we have to defer. We don't have to. We can policy everything. But I think the, the professional staff uh, makes a determination. Obviously, they're scrutinized by us. They're scrutinized by the oversight member. Uh, but in, in, in fact, uh, that is part of the flexibility. At the end of the day, these are three qualified companies. And if Helen didn't feel that way, they would have made the cut. But again, I think this is a very healthy dialogue. I want to let the minutes reflect that Luce Weinberg has joined us. So thank you for coming. Any other yeah, questions? No, actually, I was going to have a comment, but you basically nailed the, everything I had in my head, um, and rightly so. And I believe the reason we continue to have to do it is because we continue doing it. Um, and I think we're going to end up, finally, I hope, very soon, our policy committee have a serious conversation about this very issue, because it just keeps coming up, in my opinion, since I got here two years ago. Uh, yeah, so it, it might is. be time to have a serious chat about and that. And it's an interesting, challenging question for, for all boards because, you know, if you will policy it, then we're going to be disqualifying a lot more people. And is that ultimately in our best interest? That's, a, that's just a, a dialogue that we really need and, to consider. And it may not be legally supported either because there is court cases that support, you know, being waiving minor irregularities. Um, so we will be having okay. this discussion when we bring the policy okay. next month for Any, um, changes. So this will be it. Okay. So at this point, out. any other questions from the board? Any other comments? Okay. Then uh, I guess the motion to waive or to, to uh, approve a minor, to, to waive the irregularity. Do I hear a motion? It was already moved and seconded. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None? Okay. Then... It's been we'll waived. go ahead and tabulate scores, open price proposals, and then later on in the agenda, give you the final results. Yeah. Right. Thank okay. you. All right. Next on our agenda 
I guess is the uh, endorsement of the cashback toll dividend policy. That uh, we'll turn the microphone over to Marie. Treasurer, um, committee before you is our our version or draft version of our cashback toll dividend policy. Um, this was a uh, recommendation of the treasurer, and I think it was a good recommendation to put a policy together um, since this was a new program. Um, the policy sets out the objectives, the evaluation factors. Um, such as um, the overall operating results of the organization, such as revenue expenses, um, our cash flow position, general business outlook, um, our future debt obligations, um, credit rating, and any legal constraints. So that's some of the evaluation factors. Um, we've also considered um, the program criteria, and we also incorporated um, to ensure that there's a policy review on an annual basis. So that's a summarization of, of the policy, Mr. Treasurer. Okay. All right. Thank you. Board, board members, this is really, uh, I guess I would love your input, and uh, this is the foundation for this program that we've created. This is the, the, the fine print, if you will, of what this uh, policy is all about. I think uh, it's important to hear your comments. If any of you have comments, I can tell you that I personally spent a little bit of time with Marie. Uh, some of my concerns were to make sure that whatever policy we, we set in place that uh, is not subjective, that is pretty as defined as possible, because I, I think um, uh, the subjectivity would lead to problems. So I, I, what I challenge Marie is put as much as we can in there to ensure that it's not a subjective definition of what we're giving back, what we're not going to give back. I think it's, it, we've done, uh, I think, a good job. If you feel that there's room for improvement to define when, where, how we're going to give back this dividend cashback dollars, that's what I'm looking for. But uh, again, and if it's any point, point in time in the future, we need to alter this. This is a, this is a working document. But I, the more we put in the policy, the less subjectivity. And that was kind of my goal and in, in, in pushing staff. So with that said, I, that's the, kind of the preamble for our discussion. Mr. Concio? You know, I have a comment. Uh, when we were talking about, you know, the, the dividend program, we were talking about a refund of $3 million to the total user. Here we have only $2.2 million. And also, I would like to know, you know, the administration costs and how many people in MDX outsource going to be working to send the dividend and the checks to the total user, okay? Let me ask you the first question, Mr. Go Executive ahead. Director. Go. I think the, the $3 million is a threshold. It's, it's up to $3 million. So I think that's the, 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 the most in order to protect our interest. However, we're, I'm going to let uh, Marie and, and Mr. Rodriguez answer that, but I, that was intended to be a cap. The, the item before you is the actual policy. The next item, we're going to talk about the numbers and, and some of the statistics. But to answer your question, um, at the time that we presented this program, um, we presented the program with an illustration, and we gave an example of $3 million of a 20% dividend back. We've actually, in our recommendation in the next item, exceeded it because we're doing 2.2 for six months. Our illustration for the six million was at, the three million was actually for the whole year. So, actually, if you double it, is actually 4.4 million dollars. Thank you. And and I think that was done to really reflect the we heard the community. In other words, there was a, a demand. There was a lot of. Uh, uh, concerned about what we were doing, and I think we really took a program that we started at the beginning of the year, threw that affinity program away, and created this cash dividend really in a matter of months. And then we took the six-month period in an effort to say, we hear you, we, and I think we are listening to people, and, and the, it's intended to be for the people that are the highest consumers that are impacted the most, that drive from one end to the other end of the system, and that's what this cash back dividend is extended, intended for. I can tell you at a personal level, I don't qualify. I will jump on 57th Avenue, go to downtown, and I wouldn't qualify because I'm not a big consumer of our, our system. But there are people that are riding you know, the system every day, and this program is intended for those people. So, My wife's a big consumer of the... Uh, I didn't the, recognize you, but Mr. Oh, uh, Chairman oh, Martinez, sorry. <laughs> I apologize, you were correct. <laughs> Robert's rules. My, my wife is similar to you. Uh, she uses the tolls. She actually doesn't, uh, the turnpike, she doesn't use uh, our current. So that's the most important thing I think we're going to have to clarify to the public in the future is what roads qualify. But um, could you answer the questions and why we're at 2.2 and not 3 million and the amount of the administrative cost that Mr. Concio uh, discussed? Um, 
let me refer you back to the policy. One of the, the, um, the concerns that our treasurer had was about the subjectivity. So we did put some parameters in the program. We set up a floor of a million dollars. So we wanted to make sure that we weren't going to spend more money and send out $2, $5 checks. So we set the floor at a million dollars for the program. We also set the cap on the most that we would return as a dividend. I gave the example back in May or June of 20 percent, and I just I gave an example. We're setting a policy of a maximum of 30 percent. And my conversation with the treasurer is, how did you come up with that 30 percent? This is a very unique program from a standpoint of government. But we did go out and we researched what are the percentages of cash back programs or dividends and things of that nature. And it all changes based upon industry. But the average that people put a cap on is right around 30 percent. So it was really, actually it was like 25 percent. So we rounded up to 30 percent. So that's how I got to the 30 percent. Now bear in mind, this is the first year that we have registration, and this policy will be under review on an annual basis, just like all the other policies. So we set that out as the, the ceiling. Um, as far as recommendation, you know, when would it be that we would never declare a dividend? And obviously I set out some of the criteria, and some of those criteria are subjective. However, one criteria that is not subjective is the senior debt coverage. If we do not meet the minimum of the 1.5, which is in our debt policy and what we've communicated to the financial market, we will not declare a dividend. So the public now knows that they can measure. If you guys do not get to your 1.5, there will be no dividend in that particular year. Um, to Mr. Concio's question, again, I had an illustration and I gave an illustration for a full year, and I gave the example we declared dividend of three million at a 20 percent back. This pro the next item is actually for fiscal year 15, which is for six months. So for the six months, we're declaring 2.2 million dollars, and we're declaring the maximum dividend under the policy of 30 percent. So, and I'll get into that discussion a little bit later. As far as administration costs. This first year is, is my understanding from talking to really the IT side of it because they had to do some programming and they had to set up the website and so forth. And I think they spent a little bit under 200000 to do some programming changes. So I think that is a, a you know, one-time cost of setting the system up. Ongoing, um, I think we're going to have to evaluate how many calls we have. I don't think it's a, a overburden of administration cost. Um, we did buy a printer for like $2,000, a high-speed printer to send the checks out. Um, and so far, that's, that's the cost we've incurred so far. So, okay. May I? So for follow-up, so the, the costs ha that we have administratively is not in calculating the law. It's making sure we have the ability to collect as many of our clients desire to participate in the program by, by improving the website and the cashback uh, registration and by having the phone capability for people to call in. Is, is that what That's correct. I, I think what you're going to see is obviously initially we didn't have the ability to collect you know, customer data. Sure. We, you know, we created a registration page. We created a back-end database. So we're doing that, obviously, so people can register. We can, you know, gather their information. And, you know, as we learn things from this program, we may want to modify it. But the initial setup was really where the, the, the most of the cost came from. So, and again, it was to ensure that people could... Our costs are not to... To do to to move papers or and things, it's to make it easier for our clients. Nobody's going to be customers. stuffing envelopes. I mean, right? That's what I mean. <laughs> it's going to be more so so that people can get registered. If we hadn't done that, it would have been more difficult, and less people would have been able to register, and it would have caused a greater frustration. So the costs were f smart. They were logical costs on a new program. Yep. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Secretary Pago. Yeah. We're going to get into yeah. that in the next part. I was next about to up. say that. Yeah, we're, we're, you're going to hear. No, this is just a policy board a policy. member. This is just a policy that we're looking to approve after, after you're going to hear a, a presentation from Maria. It's going to go into the detail, particularly utilization and, and what is the consumption, who signed up, what percentage, and that you were able to ask those detailed questions. This is right now, it's just a policy. Yeah. So, really, uh, any suggestions, any questions on the policy? Yep. We're going to get all the information, but we're voting on the policy well, first. Well, uh, yeah. We're, to have the information. Vote on the policy. Well, the the policy is going to be the policy is going to be the the policy. We're, you know, this is something that we kind of said we're going to pass the policy. In the meantime, we decided to have this program going on. So See? the policy is not necessarily impacted by what the utilization and what we're giving back. We're, I just think it would support it. 
if I if I can if I can go back, I think the the policy or the direction the agency was going to take is going to take was already taken before, and what the way we proposed it to the board was pretty much, if you look at the evaluation factors, that's how we sold it not only to the board but to the rating agencies, our bondholders, and so forth. I think what was instructed to us by the board was go ahead and prepare a policy that actually puts parameters around it, and that's what the treasurer wanted us to do. So the numbers that we're going to get into in the next are a reflection of how we addressed what we proposed to the board back when we first adopted it, and we put it around these parameters. I understand yeah. I'm a component, uh, yeah. so I, I want to know yeah. the record center. It's just everything, we, the information we're asking to okay. a later presentation. All right. It's my so only so here, here, here's what I guess, Marie, maybe we can take things out of order. Sure. If you guys want to hear, I, I think, in, to make you, give you comfort. No, yeah. I have comfort. Okay. It's just to yeah. Well, let, let's just, the comfort, I but, but you know what? I'm, I agree with, yeah. with Vice Chair. I think it would be great to do the two of them together, and let's hear what, 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 where we're at, so, and we'll vote on the policy. So I then we, we'll hear our presentation about the cashback dividend, kind of, and then we can decide to come back to this board item and vote on it. Sure. The policy. Actually, you're going to see the policy at work. So yep. that's where I guess you could see it. Uh, I like that. And yeah. I think that's what, right. what this presentation will show. Marie? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Trader. So in order to, to um, recommend the cashback dividend, we have to look at the financial statements. We have to look at where do we end up for the fiscal year and what occurred. So that's one of the criteria that's in the policy. So we, we have this as a, as a discussion item, so I'm going to combine this with the action item. So for fiscal year 15, just as a reminder and for the benefit of the public, our fiscal year starts every July 1st, and it runs through June 30th. So the financials that I'm going to talk about are July 1st of 2014 to June 30th of 2015. These are audited financial statements, and we report our financial statements on full accrual basis accounting. And what that means is, is that revenue is reported when it's earned and expenses are reported when they're incurred. So this is not cash flow. So when you look at the financial statements and say, you know, my revenue is X, that doesn't mean I got that in my pocket. That means that it's incurred and earned. So this is an external audit. More Steve Lovelace uh, is our current auditors. They come right around the end of September, early October, and they come and audit the, the organization. They look at internal controls. Um, they spend a lot of time with uh, my staff and IT and, and procurement. So they look and see if we have controls in place, if there's policy in place, do we follow those policies, and if there's any risk associated with us having any lack of controls. Could fraud occur? Could mismanagement of assets occur? So they look at those things and they report back to the governing board right around, I believe, budget. And, they come to budget and finance in November. They also select randomly two or three board members and ask to meet with those board members. And I think last year, Ms. Fano had the opportunity to sit with the uh, auditors, and they asked her a whole slew of questions about anything she wanted to talk about, and they had a list of their questions as well, of anything that she had a concern about the organizations managing the assets and liabilities of this organization. So um, the auditors will be reaching out to at least two or three of, of the board members. Um, they also part of their audit, they prepare an opinion, and their opinion is, are the financial statements fairly presented? And what that means is, in all material respects, if someone's going to take our financial statements and make a financial decision or an investment decision, could they rely upon that? And, you know, we always hope to get a clean opinion or unmodified opinion that nothing changes, that, it's a, that financial statements are presented accordingly. Um, they also do compliance reports. They do an internal control over compliance. Are we following, again, our policies? Um, if we have um, state loans, are we following those state loan agreements? Um, that's what the schedule of financial assistance is. We, at the end of the day, we end up filing this uh, financial report with our trustee, which we're required to because we issue debt in the open market, and that's our agreement with the bondholders. We have a trustee, which is Bank of New York and Mellon. We file with the Security Exchange Commission, which is a federally regulated organization that we have certain compliances um, to follow. We follow the report with the state of Florida. We follow the report with our swap counterparty. In this case, we only have one more left. Thank God for that. And we have a single audit that we also follow with the state of Florida. And the single audit relates to any grant money that we get, um, state loans, Central Boulevard. We participated with the department on Central Boulevard, and money came from the state. So we have to make sure that we're in compliance with, with that agreement. 
and then ultimately we file with the Florida Transportation Commission, and then rating agencies also get the report, and we have to be responsive to them to answer their questions, what occurred in the financial statements. So this is the reason we actually have an audit. We have many external third party that are interested in what MDX does. So as I indicated, you know, our year end is June 30th. We prepare what's called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. It's that thick book that everybody kind of leaves behind at the end of the budget finance in November. So we won't be printing too many this year. We'll be giving you a uh, USB, and you can take it home and look at it in the computer. But it's broken down into three main sections. You have the introductory section, and if you're going to read anything, I suggest you read the introductory section because it has a management discussion and analysis. It's really kind of an executive summary. It's, it's, it's a shortened version than the whole entire financial statements. So the next section is your financial statements. It has the statements itself, and then you have the notes to the financial statements that explain what went on on the financial statements. And then you have the statistical section, which is really more trend analysis for the last 10 years of the organization. So if you wanted to know what traffic was in the last 10 years, you go to the statistical section. You wanted to know what revenue was, you go to the statistical section. So we also pre uh, prepare what's called a popular annual financial report. And again, th this is not required, but we take the added step to doing it. It's really a citizen's report. It's an even more summarized version than the MDNA. It really is a non-technical version of our financials. So we try to do that for the public as well as for any other party that may be interested in our finances. They can understand it. You don't have to be a financial person to do it. We follow the government office, uh, the GASB Accounting Standard Board, which is um, the governmental accounting practice um, to prepare our financial statements. Um, there's one pronouncement I didn't want uh, to, to mention. Um, in this fiscal year, there was a new accounting pronouncement we had to take in consideration in our financials. Um, we did not um, provide for that in this presentation. Um, we're waiting on the state. There's a new pension requirement that you have to put a liability on your financial statements for unfunded. And we, because we're part of the FRS, we share in that liability. Um, the state's not quite done yet doing their audit to give us that number, so we didn't um, include that in our financial statements. But before the auditors get here, we'll provide for that in our financial statement. This is the statement of net position, and really what this is, in, in, in the private practice, it's called, it's your balance sheet. It's, you know, what you owe, your, what you own, with your assets, who you owe money to, your liabilities, and your net worth, which is net position in governmental accounting. And it's broken out by the upper portion is your assets, current assets are usually your cash, your investments, your accounts receivable. Those are short-term assets. Non-current assets, in our case, um, the majority of that is our cash investments, our bond proceeds, which are used specifically for construction. And then you have your capital assets, which is all your construction that's happening on the roadway, plus all the projects that are complete, all the infrastructure, all the bridges, so we're, we start depreciating those assets. So you've got $1.6 billion of assets. Your other assets are, um, you know, your prepaids and things of that nature. And then deferred outflow is not an asset and it's not a liability. It's, it's shown on both sides. And basically what this is, it's two components of it. Um, when we do a refunding, there's certain things that are defer over the life of the new debt, and that's all that really is, is an amortization of those deferred charges. Um, on the current liability side, those are all the costs that the liabilities we owe construction um, contractors or current liabilities for accounts payable, as well as the current portion of debt. The next um, piece is revenue, that's our bond payables um, that are current, net of premium and discounts. And then the derivative instruments, that's the swap value of the one swap that remains outstanding. We're required to show a liability. If we were to terminate that swap agreement, we would have to pay $18 million. And then the next line item is your loans. Those are the state loans. Um, and I think we have an item on that um, later on in the meeting. Um, just to you know, reiterate what I just said, cash and investments, about $600 million. It's made up of um, restricted and unrestricted, construction, sinking fund, debt service. Our accounts receivable from FDOT, the $1. Point, uh, million dollars is uh, related to Central Boulevard. We're waiting for them to reimburse us. And then our accounts receivable is broken up into a couple of pieces. Um, we have SunPass, owes us $4.3 million. That's just a timing issue to when we close to year end. They usually pay us on a, on a, on a weekly basis. And our toll by plate customers, about $25.5 million. Um, less allowance for doubtful accounts is $18 million. So earlier I said, I didn't get that cash and I don't have it in my pocket. That's because I got receivables on the books. And then my capital assets, I explained, $1.6 million. All the roadway assets, bridges, 
um, the right to operate, all of that's included in your capital assets. Again, liability is our contractors that we owe, accounts payable, accrued expenses, general expenses, um, accrued interests. Those are all the bond payable um, interests as well as any, any state loans. And then the current portion of debt is made up of both the state and bond payable. Long term is all the state uh, bond holders and a deferred inflow. Um, again, it's the deferred charges of, of the refundings. So that's really the balance sheet at a very high level. And I'm moving this really quickly, so if anybody has any questions, please stop me. Um, I wanted to show this. This is where this is where some of the money went in fiscal year 15. We spent 104 million dollars on construction. About 91 million went to design, build, and construction. So the majority of money is not going to consultants. It's going to actual construction work. So I just wanted to show that because I think that's that's it's very important to know where we spent our money last year. This is the statement of revenue and expenses and change in net position. This is what is called in the private sector your, your p and L, your profit and loss statement. So you have your total and fee revenue net. We've earned $182 million. As you noticed, I said we earned $182 million. It's broken up in a couple of pieces, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute on, on another slide. And then we have our other um, income, which is mainly made up of lease revenue. And then we have our operating expenses. Operations, is, it was $32 million compared to last year, which was $23 million. Um, so why did it go up? We had more transactions. We had more costs for full open road tolling. Um, and then we also had some additional costs associated with um, starting to pay for the maintenance of the, of the lanes. Maintenance uh, pretty much stayed pr pretty much the same. Professional administration items, it was about $6 million in fiscal 15 compared to about $6.7 million in fiscal 14. And again, it shows a, we actually went down in fiscal 15. Um, I can't really take credit for that. I think in 14, we had higher legal costs than we did in 15. But again, it just shows good management on administration side. Um, interest and dividend investment income, 2.1 million compared to 2.7 million. Um, bond issuance costs, that, that is related to all the costs on our bond issuance. And that was for series 2014B that we did the refunding for. I believe that was September of 2014. Interest expense, that's all the interest expense on our bonds as well as our, our state loans. So finally, you get down to your net position change of $54.8 million. On the net and toll fee revenue, this is the breakout. We had $148 million from SunPass. We had cash for a short period of time during the year, about $1.8 million. And then toll by plate net is made up of the what, gross number as well as allowance for doubtful accounts. Um, so the net amount is $30 million. And then we did provide for the cash back dividend offset of 2.182. That's the exact number in the air. I think it says 2.2. I'm going to talk about the, the cash dividend um, a little bit later uh, in a moment, actually. And then we had, you know, fees associated with, you know, late fees and processing, um, trying to collect the money for toll by plate, about $4.3 million. So that is the revenue um, overview for fiscal 15. Just kind of high level on some of the financial results year over year, as you can see, this is toll revenue. I showed you $182 million of actual toll and fee revenue, our toll revenue um, was 178 compared to the forecast of 179. So pretty much less than 1%. We're pretty flat. We were right on target in what we anticipated. What's interesting on this slide is um, this is transactions, and we're about 9.9 .9 million more transactions occurred than what was forecasted. And what we concluded, what this really means is, is that when Warwick Smith um, prepared their forecast, they actually provided for a higher diversion of traffic that didn't occur. So we, we actually had 10 million more transactions than what we anticipated. So I think that that's very good news. Um, some of the financial results, this is a summarization of the, um, the P&L um, year over year. And as you can see, um, I want to bring your attention to the senior debt coverage, which is very important for us. Um, that's one of the highest coverages we have posted for a very long time. Um, you look at 2007, we had 236 2008, 1.9, 1.73 in 2010. So again, I think the trend um, is, is starting to, to show positive results. Um, so I'm happy to report the, the debt coverage at 2.2. I'm going to stop there if anybody has any questions. 
Mr. Mr. Be before you answer that, I, I think it's important that you all look at that last, that debt coverage is so important to our overall bond rating. That is so critical, and I think that is, you know, so important. That means we can buy money cheaper or borrow money cheaper, and that is so important. And getting our bonding rates up, and we're, we're in the process of trying to secure those rates, and this is a very compelling argument to say why we need to have our bonding uh, increase. Uh, Mr. Uh, Martinez. Yes. Uh, Marie, first, um, I... I understand that some of this makes a heck of a lot more sense to you than it does to me. <laughs> so let me ask a real simple question. We have, if you could go back to the slide that discussed at one, a couple more back. 24, 25 million, I believe, last year, this year we've collected 54 million. Is that correct? Go to the P&L. You know? Yeah. Where are you looking? I'm sorry. The, the change in net position. Change in net position. Uh, Thank you. Marie, from 14 to 15. Okay, so you're on yes. this right slide. There. Stop. Perfect. Right there. Thank you. Correct. Okay. The net position. Right. right. So, so what, did ha what happened to revenue, you know, compared to last year? Well, obviously, we had, you know, we went to open road tolling. We had more tolling points. So it's, you know, sometimes it's not comparable. You have to explain why. So we didn't have open road tolling in fiscal 14. We had it in fiscal 15. Mm -hmm. So obviously, there was an increase in revenue. Right. That part I got. The, the, the question I have is not that. We're telling um, the, the community that we have an overabundance uh, of around $2.1 million, $2.2 million that we have to available. But someone looking at this sees that we've increased our input by over $29 million. So that to a person who doesn't comprehend the, 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 how this works, Correct. they're going to say, well, why are they only giving back $2 million when they actually have 29 Well, and keep I in mind to, that the p and is, But let's again, explore that. The, the P&L is based upon, it's accrual accounting, number one. It's okay. not a cash, you know, basis. So Good. what's not in the P&L is, is your debt, your principal payments. That's okay. What so I to hear. you have to look at that and say, well, <laughs> this is just a P and L is what did you earn and what expenses did you pay? You Thank have you. other liability that is not in your P and L. Your interest expenses, but your principal and your repayment of debt is not included in there. And, and that. So, and that's important for us to emphasize very strongly to those. And it has, this has not as much to do with us, but we're trying to be much more clear in communicating to our clients. Correct. So we need to explain why that number is accurate, but there are issues that are, that are expenses and are liabilities that are not you, included. You in can't there. take that number and say that's what you have. That do, it it yes. doesn't work that way. So you look at paying your principal debt. You also look to see what happens every year. You have to reevaluate your sure. reserves. So you have to say, i got to put money back into my reserves to meet those requirements. Right. And then you say, well, what's left? Whatever happens. Well, then you have obligations that you have to do for R&R. We're required under the, the bond indenture to fund up our R&R. So we do that bucket. So that's the third bucket. And then we basically say, what do we need to fund up fiscal 16's construction pay as you go because mm -hmm. this board has made a decision that they want to keep pre the pressure off toll rates and not have to be in a position of issuing 100% of debt. That was the decision that was made, I think, back in 2013 when we did the debt, debt policy that we were going to put a down payment for the mortgage. We weren't going to do 100% of mortgage. And I think that was very prudent of this board to do that. So then we take that money and we put it into our pay-as-you-go bucket. Now, if the money... Go ahead. No, no. Distract me there. No, no, no. It, I'm sorry. Is it the, I, so, so, I want, uh, go on. So My what apologies. ends up happening is we build up our pay-as-you-go bucket. So if one year, you know, we don't declare a dividend or we don't declare as much because too many people don't register, however it, it kind of works out, the money is going to go as your pay-as-you-go bucket. So the following year, I may not need as much to go in my pay-as-you-go bucket, and I might have more money to give back to the public. So it really is more of an ongoing yeah. effect when we look at the financials. Marie, let, me, let me interject here for a second. Uh, Chairman Martinez, I, I, we had a similar conversation, you know, and part of this policy is to ensure that the subjectivity, you know, when do we declare what is, what is reserves, what is the pay-as-a-go budget, what is our minimum requirements, and defining those. And I think part of this policy is exactly to address, you know, how we're declaring, what we're declaring, then what are we putting for reserve. So we have an, a major obligation to, to debt financing. Oh, absolutely. So I, I you, think... You're, you're absolutely correct, Mr. And, and what's very important is that we disclosed in the public offering document that we would do pay as you go. That we would, exactly. and Randy's here and he can speak to that as well. But it's very important that those commitments are met first. 
So the reserves are first, on all the legal documents, we have to fund up all of that, and then it goes back to finish the construction. We borrowed X amount of dollars to finish this work program, and that, that work program, we weren't going to issue any more debt for this work program. So we have to make sure that we're on track to continue to fund up that work program and finish the projects. Oh, and, and let's be clear, I, I in no way Our here before him. I was recognizing you again. Oh, no, it was, it, was, it was a Q&A with me. <laughs> in no way was I questioning what it is, is. And I have been very well briefed by staff on these issues. So I already knew what your answer was going to be when I asked it. But what's important for us, I think, and this is why I'm emphasizing this and I'm telling staff this as well, is it's not about the 13 members of the dais. It's not about us. We are, we are individually briefed, we are individually, many of us have experience and we get this. What's more important for us as a, as a body, and I think is the one thing I really want to emphasize strongly, and Mr. Board Member Concio has indicated it too, is we need to let the public know what we do and why. When somebody goes out there who and tries to attack us and says, well, they have $29 million, they don't have two, they're hiding the other $27 million, I want it to be clear that that's not true. And the only way to do that is for us to be as concise about where that money is going, and, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm not calling you to task, I'm just simply asking you to explain what I already knew. And I'm sure, and that's the key to what I think part of what we are going to do as much as possible in the future is we want the public to know where their dollars are going. Now, they're going to see the results on the roads, but they're going to see that this is why we're doing this, and that's why I wanted to explain that. That's all. Yep, Mr. Ahead. Chair, if I may, th this goes to the heart of the issues that we faced last year in legislature where there were proposals to take a percentage of our net revenues just based on looking at numbers and what potentially could happen this year, and I've heard the grumblings, and there are folks still looking at uh, MDX has a lot of cash. Let's take it off the top and put it for transit. What happens if you go that route, and this is something to consider, is that the minute you do that and you make that obligation and it goes above the line, then you're putting more pressure on the agency to have to adjust toll rates to maintain that. Because what never is discussed is that it won't be a recurring uh, cost. The bill last year that was defeated would be 20% of net revenues on an annual basis. Well, that becomes an expenditure, which means you're never going to get rid of it, so you're actually putting pressure on re raising the toll rates to make that happen. Mm -hmm. It defeats the purpose. And, and, and this year I'm hearing the grumblings again because people look at the P&L, they look at our statements, sure. they think we have 54 or 29 million sitting around, and what's 10% of that? It's nothing. And, and that's the issue. And we, we're, try we're going out and educating as much as we can. The problem is that, that we don't have the bully pulpit, and, and, that, is a, and that, is a, that is an issue. So we've spoken to the chairman. He's going out and speaking as much as he can about these things, and we're doing this here at Budget and Finance with the treasurer because our best ambassadors are sitting on this dais, right. and that's the, that's the important part of this. The, the reality is we have become too effective, and you guys are too good at what you do. And that's a, that's a compliment. But you're too good at what you do. You're too good at finding ways to, 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 to be successful. And there are entities that want to take advantage of that. And the fear I have is in the future, to pay Peter, they're going to they're hurt Paul. And that is, could be, and the end day, nobody gets it. Nothing gets done. And that's why we need to be very clear where we don't have this pot of gold that people think we have. That's Correct. all. And I apologize. No. Mr. Chairman, any other board members, any comments? Ms. Bonner? Thank you for Quint my thirst for knowledge and you only solidified my supporting the toll policy. Thank you. I appreciate you Thank going you. out of schedule. Mr. Concio? Mr. Marie, only I, I want to ask you know, a question here. Looking in the attainment of a net position, okay, you have, a, you have 54 more million yes, in, in 2015. Yes. But looking in the current asset, from 389 go to, to 370. That means that we had $59 million less. What is the chain in that? Because uh, I would like to, in the current asset. The current yeah, assets? Yeah, you have in 2014, you have 389. And 2015, you have 370. At the end, you are 54 million more. But we are 54 million, you're saying, less. We have 389 in current assets in fiscal 14 and 330 in, in fiscal 15. 
Basically what that is, is in that line item is, is cash and investments. So we move our bond proceeds into the current assets. So as we use the money, the difference is that we basically had more construction um, in fiscal 14 than we did in 15. So that's what the, the cash was actually used for. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any other questions the board? And Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the comments you make. I think it is important that we communicate that. I think part of your mission on behalf of our official spokesperson for the board is to communicate that, that we don't have this excess fund sitting around. So I appreciate you emphasizing that and making that a, a, a highlight of our conversation. So uh, with no other questions, Marie. I'll continue on? Yes, please. Okay. So the next portion of the, of the presentation is um, going to be of interest to everybody. We're getting into the cash dividend uh, back policy, policy. So in the policy, we set up some criteria and some evaluation factors. So what I attempted to do here was say the policy said that we had to make sure that we met our forecast. So we're looking at some of the financial performances now in order to declare fiscal 15's dividend. So from a traffic and revenue pr uh, projection, as I indicated in my financial presentation, we met our obligation. We met the forecast. We were a little bit less than 1% below the forecast, so we really were on target. The policy says that you have to exceed 1.5 coverage to even contemplate giving a dividend. But in the policy also, there's an evaluation factor that we have to make sure that we meet our forecasted dividend because the forecasted dividend is what we told the bond market we were going to achieve. So the floor is the one five. So not only did we exceed what we forecasted, we also met the floor. We exceeded the 1.5. So things are looking good to declare a dividend in fiscal 15. So I also put in operational. Are we meeting our capital expenditures? Are we on track for that? Are we on track for getting our procurements out the door? Um, are they any unknown, business operational unknowns at this point in time before we declared a dividend? So speaking from the executive director and other management, the answer is no. There's nothing that could negatively impact that we're not aware of. And then the final criteria that we have in the policy, again, we want to look at it before we declare it for fiscal 15, what's the liquidity position? And what liquidity means is what's our cash position? What do we have on a pocket? So why is that important? We want to make sure that we fund up our reserves. We want to make sure that we fund up our pay as you go. So we're always a year, a year behind. So fiscal 15's money is going to be used for fiscal 16's pay as you go. So people say, well, you got money here. What are you going to do with it? Well, I got fiscal 16's um, construction that I need to pay for. And if fiscal 16's cash flow is not what I need it to be, then in 17, I got to dip into reserves. That's kind of how it works. So it's an ongoing effect. So we looked at those financial benchmarks, and all of those are in the policy. That's why we kind of had the, the policy first, Mr. Treasurer. So we feel that we are in a position to declare a dividend. So just as a reminder what the cash back program was, originally we had an advantage program, and that was based upon how many times you rode the roadway, um, and we sort of re renamed it to the cash back dividend program. That program wasn't to start until fiscal 16 which is the current year we're in now. So we never contemplated to have any reward or any cash back in fiscal 15. Um, but the governing board said, I want to have something in 15, so we made it retroactive for half of the year of 15, from January 1st of 15 to June 30th of 15. So that was half of our year of fiscal 15. So in the, in the program, the minimum threshold that you had to spend tolls on MDX roadway was $100 for the year. But since this was for six months, we cut it in half and said, well, we want people to, to qualify. So we said the qualifications would be $50 instead of $100. So that's, that's kind of a summarization of the program. So the registration period, I'm sure Mario's going to go over some of the other marketing and, and registration. So we originally opened registration up from January 1st to April 30th. It was really supposed to be for March. But the board made a decision at one of the policy meetings to extend it another 30 days. So we opened it up for four straight months. After the program was renamed, after the program was renamed, we opened it up again. So on July 7th, we opened it up to August 31st. So if you really look at it, the program's been opened up pretty much almost six months for the year. Um, what ended up happening? We had transponders of almost 83,000 for 83,000. If I say numbers, please correct me because I'm, I'm on 
transactions now. So we had 83,000 transponders that registered. 37, almost 38,000 actually qualified that spent $50 or more. It's 46% of the registration. So we wanted to see what happened to the other roughly 50%. 13,000 basically didn't pay any tolls. And I sort of suspect maybe those tolls weren't, they did pay toll, they just didn't pay it to us. So 13,000 of the 82 didn't pay MDX any tolls. Um, of that 13,000, we had about 33,000 that related to the county. And then of the remaining, 31 paid less than $50. So the 31, they paid anywhere from 10 to $40. So they, did, they weren't close to the threshold is what I was getting at there. So we wanted to see if someone's at 49 or a high percentage of 48. They were in anywhere from 10 to $40. So that is really kind of the makeup of what happened to the 82,000 transponders. Marie, to clarify, the 3,000 county, those are county vehicles. Well, okay. let, me, let me further yeah. clarify that. I think they're gov government, yep. government, so it could be municipalities, it could be other governmental entities, because I asked the same question, it was like specifically county, or the county and other municipalities that are benefiting from uh, this program. <coughs> Oh, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I want to ask a request. You know, the, the actual chairman have to use more, you know, the tolls and to pay more than $50, okay? Luis, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there you go. But he's not getting a cash back. <laughs> Marie, do we know what that county uh, number was for the ones who did qualify? Just I think when we looked at it, um, I think it was 21,000 out of the 2.2 were declaring. So I think they're getting about $21,000 back out of, from, of the total. Yeah. I don't know how many transponders that is. Yeah. Yeah, we, um, we, we asked that question uh, in our meeting, and I, I think uh, it is important to highlight. But yeah, there, there's a benefit to other governmental entities. So not only do you prevent the public, we benefit the public twice, actually. And, and so, so sorry to interrupt you. And to further if you want to take that question, you know, what are they doing with that extra money? I'm sure they're giving it back to their residents and the constituents. <laughs> Continue, Marie. Okay. Um, so this is really a snapshot of the program. So we're recommending a $2.2 million payout. And again, the example that we had given at one of the meetings was $3 million for the full year. So we're giving $2.2 for half a year. So we're actually giving more than our example. And our example also showed a 20% dividend payout. We're doing a 30%, which is the maximum per the policy, should the board pass that policy today. Um, so we're taking the eligible customers. These eligible customers, they signed up on the website. Um, they have valid transponders. Um, they agreed to the terms and conditions. And they spent more than $50 during the six-month period. So what I tried to attempt to do here was to break out that 37000 into different categories, different levels, so to speak. And then how much was the range of how much tolls they spent for the six-month period? Technical difficulty, I'm sorry. So... The next was the average tolls. If they spent X amount um, for the six-month period, I, we came up with a calculation of how many days they would ride the roadway to come up with the average toll, daily toll, they, the range they paid. And then the next column shows, well, how much are these people going to get back in that range? And we, you know, for the first line item, the 7, 74000 um, anywhere $15 or $22. And then the last column basically says, well, what was the effect of giving that cash back to those, those users? What did it do to their toll rates? So we basically showed what the toll rates would be after the cash back. So we did that for each of the categories that's listed up there. Um, I want to bring you, your attention to the bottom category of the 372, which is 1% of the 37 that's spent over $600. So... The maximum that you could pay on our roadway by doing a round trip to, to, to commute to and from home, taking the extension all the way to downtown and doing the same route, or taking 874, taking 836 and going back the same way is $4.80. So 
So the people who spent more than $4.80, we conclude those people are doing multiple trips. Um, I think one example, we, a couple of examples we looked at, we have cab drivers that ride up and down the roadway. We have service people, obviously user vehicle for business purposes. So the 372 are pe- not necessarily commuters, but they're more business-related kind of trips that are happening there. Marie, let me, let me touch on that point for a second. I think, you know, that was probably the, the point of here was the, uh, we got complaints from a small businesses. You know, if you have multiple vehicles on the road, well, this is intended to help that small mom-and-pop uh, entities. At the same time, we discussed that uh, there are these cab drivers, and, and, and there may be an opportunity for cab drivers to be benefiting from this because you normally pass that that fare on to your cab, to your, to your fare. So these, this somebody who's in the cab industry will charge us for it, but then we're going to send them a check at the end of the year. So that's some of the things that we're looking at uh, fixing, if you will, because this is a new program. So one of the things that uh, may be recommended is define what profession you're in or what type of company you're in, because we really don't want people necessarily making money off of this. It's intended to give money back, not benefit from it. So just little, little nuances that are important, and as this program develops, we will identify and, and kind of hone in on, on refining the program. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Um, I'm happy to say that I've, I've, I fall into the 6.4 category, so I'm going to get $90 back. So I, I do pay the tolls. <laughs> I'm... I'm <laughs> That's my Christmas bonus. Um, so it was interesting that we put this together. You know, we had 80-some thousand registered, 37 um, qualify. And from speaking to the marketing folks, when you do any kind of marketing or survey, you get a very, you're lucky if you get 2% to, to, to respond to your surveys. But what we think is this sample pool is a good sample of what our ridership really is. Because when we look at the numbers, if you recall Ed Reagan, who spoke at a couple of the committee meetings, you know, he said the, the average person doesn't drive end-to-end on the roadway. Most of our trips are mid-trips or smaller trips that are happening, and most people don't drive the same way going home, and I think Javier brought that issue up. So when you look at the analysis here, you can see that the most of the people are on the lower end, the 19% through, I don't know what, 10%, um, that's the range. Those people take the shorter trips. You have a very low percentage that actually do the entire trip. In this example, less than 2% would pay the 480, the maximum of, of that tier level. So the statistics of this is, 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 is very close to what Warbert Smith indicated on what the trend analysis on, on the trip on our expressways. And, yeah, and, Mar- and Marie, the MPO actually did an analysis on this. And in looking at where they call it transportation analysis zones, when they model traffic in Miami and they project where you need to address things, they look at where people live, where they work, where they go to school. Those are the things they look at. And what they found in this presentation at the MPO is that there was a time in Miami where you lived in the west or south and you commuted to the CBD, to the central business district and back. It was very directional. We remember those days that everybody came in the morning east and west in the afternoon. What they found today is that there's as many people going from downtown to Doral as there is from Kendall to Doral, that what you're seeing are smaller percentages of people going distributed through the county. <coughs> This actually validates that analysis that Wilbur Smith did. And, and this is the third analysis that I see. This one's actually hard numbers. But I've seen the MPO. I've seen consultants do it uh, for, for various reasons. And it's a fascinating uh, uh, issue. The fact that Doral has grown so great as far as jobs, people are commuting there. The other part of it is 30,000 people or so, right, Marie, that didn't qualify or paid the amount of money. Yes. I venture to say that most of the tolls that they paid, because they do pay tolls, was not on the, it is not on the MDX system, it's on the Turnpike system. But again, from a communication standpoint, the commuter doesn't disti- uh, distinguish between us. To them, it's a toll account and it's MDX. So that's part of our communication strategy that we, that we have to uh, convey. Sorry, Murray. <laughs> 
Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. I just did more of a narrative of the table. And I, again, you know, 54% of the 37 paid anywhere from 50 to, uh, you know, 150. Um, so I'm not going to go over that unless someone has something particular that they would like to ask on that. Um, so the recommendation, based upon the financial performance and the policy we laid out, we're recommending for fiscal year 15 a 2.2 payout at a 30% cash back to eligible members, which is a 37,000 people. And um, we hope to be able to mail those checks out in December. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Oh, Concio, then Mr. Pagel. Oh, Mr. Chairman, let me, let me make a comment. Yes. You know, this uh, committee meeting today, so important. They highlight, you know, the cash dividend. And we don't have anyone from the user, like Mr. Garcia came here, 175 days here, only one person come to complain. And today is a highlight. People going to be very important. You know, the people look that, you know, that we are trying to do something for the user, and it's something that maybe we have to put it in our communication department to try to see if it makes some news about this uh, dividend. At least, are you going to be in the, in the cash dividend program or no? You? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Concho, you make, you make some, some great points, and this is something that we've struggled with for a long time. You know, we get blamed for a lot of things, and we put information out here, and then people kind of have selective memory, if you will. But I think you make an excellent point, and that's part of our overall struggle. And I think our chairman is on a mission now to communicate not only this, but all the wonderful things we do. And it is unfortunate that we don't have the room full of people saying thank you or asking questions or even making this a better product or a better policy. But it is part of the challenges that we face on a regular basis, and that's part of the, the, the small print that when you signed up for this job <laughs> is, you know, you're going to get a lot of kicks, you're not going to get a lot of pats in the back, and this is uh, uh, what it is, and that's part of our responsibility in staying the course, you know, doing what we believe is right, and I think we have a lot of committed people on this board uh, in getting that message out through communications department as well as the chairman. And uh, it's our struggle. Uh, Mr. Pagel. Thank you, Chairman. I, I'd like to, I, again, compliment Marie and, and Javier and the whole team for the great presentation, great analysis, giving back to the community. Um, you know, but for the new members on the board, what if you didn't have a cash back policy at all, what would happen with that $2.2 million? That would go back to the pay-as-you-go construction. Mm -hmm. It's okay. a cumulative effect. If okay. we have a shortfall one year, we'd have to make it up the following year. If we have an overage, it's still going to go back to that bucket. So at the end of the five years, if you have construction prices continuing to rise over your forecast of construction costs, we'll end up pushing projects out we'll of, be of the five-year end, correct? We'll be end up pushing projects out or finding another way to finance them. Right. Okay. If I may. Ms. Weinberg. Um, I actually would have ended up on that. Not qualif probably not qualified or only if I had registered my trips that mostly involve heading to the airport and coming to MDX meetings and I do do a lot of airport uh, travel um, but I'm more of the northeast commuter and it'll be great if the state had a, a cashback program because I just pay nine dollars to ride the express lanes to get here this morning which is more than the average person I've double what the average person uh, pays to ride our entire system um, so I think we're we're making a great um, a dent and uh, impact to the community and their bottom line, their pockets. It's uh, to be applauded. And you're right, it's a shame nobody's here, but we still do the great things when nobody's looking. So that's great of, as an agency. Whether I go, am I going to do something like us here? <laughs> I, I, I think, I think we, we may be setting up a trend here. Um, any other questions, Mr. Myers? Yeah, just two quick questions. As far as registered transponders, that then would not include a family account, or would it include a family account? Individual. So, for example, I, it's, it's I have two, account, two transponders on my account, right? So individual. It's not, it's not individual. It's, it's transponder. I have to, we're going to cut a check, you know, for each transponder. So, no, the 82 that is transponders. Theoretically, in that table, I would qualify for both my Twice. car and yep. my wife's right. car, so yep. I'd, okay. You would yep. get two Just trying to figure out who's going to get the money yeah. <laughs> when the checks come. <laughs> uh, I, no, but I, I do want to clarify that because I think that may become a, a point of confusion for some folks that have multiple transponders on an account and say, well, cumulatively, 
I should be at this level. And just something, you know, Mario, something that I think we need to look at to potentially address, because I think that that will come up. I think we were very clear when we did the terms and conditions yeah. um, on the website. When you registered, we, we thought about that, and we put that in the terms and conditions, that they agreed that it was per transponder to qualify. Sure. It's just, unfortunately, many folks, as we recently saw in a big exposure... Uh, that people don't read terms and conditions when they apply for things. And that exposure has nothing to do with MDX nor anything in Miami, just an international exposure. I think you all know what I'm referring to. <laughs> and then the other comment I wanted to make, because it was very surprising to me when I saw that 82,000 or 83,000 roughly registered, many of which we see probably assume they're paying MDX but are paying Turnpike and I-95 tolls, when you look at in that 10% user category that you referred to, roughly 30,000 transponders are in that, that range. For a six-month period of time, it's about 20, just under 26 weeks. So they're paying just under $10 a week in tolls. And that's taking a large group of users. Um, that's, that's not a substantial amount of tolls that people are paying on a weekly basis if you cut two cups of coffee out of your daily routine, that can easily pay for your entire commute for a year. So I, I just found that very surprising because it's really not a lot of, of dollars being spent on their MDX commute. And if people budget themselves uh, correctly, I think that that could be easily, easily affordable and manageable. I just wanted to make that comment. I, th I think you're correct, and, and your statistical um, analysis that our traffic revenue came up with, that most people would touch one or a half gantry, about 85, a little bit over 85 cents. So it's roughly a little bit less than $1.53 a day is the, just over 70 percent. That's, that's what the tolls that they would incur. Yes, you have a question? Uh, um, AJ, you're 100 percent correct, and I think what these facts are, this is not a, you know, a 389-person poll like we're seeing with some of these national polls where there's, they're, they're, ca they're calling 390 people, and that's a national poll. This is, 30, this is a 39,000-person hard fact poll that shows that what we're hearing about the exorbitant amount that people are paying, and I'm not questioning that people are paying it. I'm sure they are. But it has very little or virtually nothing to do with our MDX tolls. It has more to do with the combination of tolls. And I will say, I won't, I won't mention the person by, uh, by name, but there have been prominent reporters who during their doing interviews and other things have, ma have made complaints about paying $10 on I-95 and attributing that to MDX, where one of the things that has been a important part of our, of our, of our communications, and I, I emphasize it every time I'm, I'm interviewed, and they interview every day, is we have nothing to do with the her Pike, and we have nothing to do with I-95. Those are not our responsibilities. I'm not questioning their toll policies, but I'm simply saying that those aren't our policies. And the most difficult part is there are people, and I'll call them, those who are using us for, for their own personal gains, they're lumping all of their issues to us, and when hard data is shown to them, it doesn't matter. This is a tremendous showing of what we're talking about. 54% uh, are spending less than $25 a month on our tolls. Yeah. That's just a reality. That's not me making it up. So, and I think it's, it's, this is beneficial in so many ways. First, we're giving money back, and second, we are showing hard data that can offset the never-ending mantra that we're hearing out there. And for that, I congratulate both the treasurer, budget, and, for, and Marie and staff for putting this together because it, it makes it very irrefutable what the reality is. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your comments. I think this last uh, slide, you all have gotten a hand out of this. This is probably the most powerful, impactful document that you can share. So when people say, you know, I'm tired of, of paying tolls and, you know, what you guys did and all this stuff that we're hearing, I think this puts it into black and white. What were you repaying before we approved the policy in 2014? What happened in 2015? And what is the net effect of this cashback uh, policy? I mean, it's pretty black and white, and I think if you, if you flip through this page, you'll see that there's an incredible amount of data that basically says, we heard what people are saying, we heard the outcry, and we've made our adjustments to, to really benefit the people who are utilizing our system the most. So I think 
in a short period of time, we've created some incredible uh, programs, and I don't know of any governmental entity that moved so quickly that we did to respond to what, uh, what the outcries were. So I think this, the impact of this, and I encourage all of you to review it, ask any questions, but this is black and white. This is what people, are, in essence, will be paying. Uh, as a result of this cashback dividend program. Mr. Rodriguez. No, and I thank you, board members. Um, this is the conversation we had last two years ago when we did the toll rate policy, and we shared the statistics, and we vetted those statistics with the, with the consultant. And, and it's always a forecast, so you, you don't know. Um, this validates a lot of that. I, I do want to clarify something, Mr. Mr. Treasurer and Mr. Chairman and board members. Um, if you looked at our financials, you know, and, and, you, and you see we're doing good. I mean, we're, we're doing good. Our mission at MDX is to move people in goods. When I talk about, you know, last year bills trying to take revenue, net revenues for transit, it presumes that MDX has never wanted to participate in transit, which is not the case. In fact, I, I and I think uh, the chairman was, was with me when we met with a, a particular commissioner. I said, you know, I've made a mistake in my nine years. We have not quantified what we have spent in construction dollars to accommodate transit because that was never something that I wanted to go out there and pat ourselves on the back for. I guess I should have because in a conversation we had with a particular commissioner who wants to have an express service, it was very refreshing to be able to say we're ready because we've already accounted for this. And there was other agencies that have to take that into account and see what it would cost to construct, hard and shoulder, so on and so forth. So. By no means, my comments as far as, as, as bills taking net revenue is anything against us being partners to deliver projects. It's simply that this notion that we have so much money and people can just take at it, is, that's the issue. It's not that we wouldn't partner with people to get projects done. I've always said prioritize it, and MDX is always at the table. If I may, make one Mr. Comment. Chairman, I think it's important to emphasize that in our projects already, like on the 836, we are already preparing for the future where we are going to be partners in the in the in the public transportation system. We have hardened, and this is something that is again something that we need to do a better job of getting out there. Our our um, shoulders are already prepared for express buses to be able to go on the east-west route if that, if that is the decision of the community and how to, one of the answers that can be going. And one of the things I emphasize every time I meet with someone, and, and Javier is a tremendous ambassador of this agency, is that we are a willing partner to work with any entity who is looking to benefit transportation. The reality is, folks, we all know this, we could build 10 lane highways each way and it wouldn't be enough expressways. We need to find other alternatives and we are willing partners. But you can't hurt Paul to help Peter. You need to be able to help work with both. Peter needs to work with Paul, not be taken over by Paul. And that's basics. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the board? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so right, so we do have a motion. Any other questions for Marie? Marie, I want to thank you, and I want to thank your staff. You guys have put together uh, a lot of information, have really stepped up in a short period of time and uh, created a great program. And I think this is a model for the national program. So I know that we have a policy that we have to approve, so that it was a motion that was on the table. So I guess at this point, uh, we would need to have a vote on the motion to adopt the policy. So... Um, let me make sure that this would be the D. endorsement. Item D. T, the endorsement of a cashback uh, policy. We, we yeah, we one out of order. Right. Yeah. So, so it would be the endorsement yeah. of the cashback policy. So that's a motion that we have on the table. Uh, if hearing no questions, uh, I guess we have a, a mo motion. Uh, I guess all in favor to adopt this policy. Signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Seeing none. Okay. Motion is adopted. Okay. okay. Dividend. Okay. So, so then we now. So what you're saying is we now need a motion to approve uh, the endorsement of fiscal year 2015 cashback program. So, do I hear a motion on that? I'm moving, I'm moving it. Okay. Second. I'll second it. Second, Chairman Martinez. All in favor of. Uh, Endorsing a fiscal year 2015 cashback uh, program? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, motion moves. Thank you again, 
I, you were right. They, I think it worked out very well, uh, Madam Vice Chair. I think it worked out well. So let's move move on on, on the uh, next agenda item. She's ready. Okay. So, Helen, you're ready with your final results. Um, this is, would be the original item G that we moved to C. And since we waived the minor irregularities, we have now tabulated the scores. And uh, Maria Luis is passing out the um, tabulation matrix to show the final results. Um, the final results has First Southwest ranked as number one, Sogras Asset Management ranked as number two, and Chandler um, Asset Management ranked as number three, including the um, fee proposal score. All right. Helen, what was it without the the price proposal built in? What were the without rate? the price proposal, the number one and the number two were um, switched by a point. So without the price proposal, um, first Southwest was still number one with 218 points. Charlie was number. Um, excuse me. Um, Sawgrass Asset Management was number. First Southwest was number two with 218. China was um, number two, uh, number two with 217 and. Um, Sober Assessment Management was number three with um, 216. Ms. Fano, you have a question? Well, actually, same results. Same results with or without price. I apologize. Same results with or without price. Ms. Fano, my, my question was, if, if we didn't add in the cost of services, which is a price component, would the ranking have changed? What was the ranking? So that's, I wanted a clarification on that. Okay. So I guess at this point, do we need a motion to uh, award the recommendation? Moved. Correct. Right. Okay. Endorsement of this um, score so moving forward for board approval technical. of selecting number one rank proposal. So it's the endorsement technical evaluation committee's recommendation to select the number one rank proposal. Do I hear a motion, Mr. Pago? Second. Yeah, I'm sorry, comments? The number one rank proposal is for Southwest Asset Management. Yeah. That, yeah. Pretty okay. Pretty well. Hello. No problem. Yeah. I'll second. Okay. Second. All in favor of uh, making a recommendation? Aye. 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 Seeing no, the move is approved, and uh, I guess First Southwest, uh, congratulations to them. Okay. What is next on our agenda here? The next item is endorsement to defeat state this, loans. Okay. Item All right, four e. Are you going to address that? Yes. Um, this was an item that was brought forth um, last fiscal year. We requested, obviously, in, in an effort to continue to manage our debt, to... The fees to the state loans, and um, the board directed us to um, move forward with that. And we went to the state, and the state agreed. They had the option to say yes or no. This is the actual agreement that we will be um, defeasing the loans with the state um, for the SIB loans, which is two outstanding and four, uh, four toll facility. Um, we have provided for this in our uh, financial statements. So the attachment is the agreement that we will be um, paying off the loans. I guess do I hear a motion then to uh, endorse fees into state Move. loans? Okay. Second. First, second, third, fourth. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Here, no. Move. Motion is adopted. Okay. Let's move on now to, um, I guess, the uh, MDX procurement contract number FRP 1604 financial auditing. Would uh, that be Helen? Uh, who's yeah. covering that? Okay. Thank that you, would be sir. item F. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, correct. RFP, um, MDX procurement contract number RFP 1604 for financial auditing services. The requested action is to approve to advertise the request for proposals for the financial auditing services. The current contract that we have, it's going to expire now that the uh, fiscal 15 um, audit is completed. And so we're asking to go out with a new RFP to solicit for the services. Um, we are also asking for the technical evaluation committee composition. We would need an um, MDX board oversight. Um, and the composition will be um, based on finance, um, total operations, and IT staff, um, who are the ones that participate um, mostly with the, uh, um, with the um, audit process, other than procurement, but we stay out. Um, we're recommending no small and local business participation in this contract. And um, the f fiscal impact of the annual um, um, amount will be based on what the proposers um, bid, the winning proposer. Uh, but we're estimating that it would be about $65,000 a year. 
to perform the um, audit. Okay, so we need a, a motion, I guess, to advertise this. Move. Okay, first. Second. Second, thank you. Um, I guess we vote on this. So all in favor of putting this RFP out, signify saying aye. Aye. Okay. Now we need to, uh, anybody oppose, just for the record? Hearing none, okay. Um, then we need to name an oversight board member. Uh, Mr. Walters, would you, as a new board member, I figured this would give you some experience. Is that something you would be willing to undertake? Well, thank you for graciously accepting that. No pressure. Um, <laughs> for volunteering. Thank you for volunteering. Okay, so uh, that then we move on to the next agenda item, and that's really at the announcements. So, board me board meeting next uh, Tuesday at typical time, 4 p.m. Thank you all for your participation, Mr. Chairman. Move to adjourn. Thank you.